Good morning, guys. Morning, Scott. Welcome to Grace Men Live. Question for you. Listen to this statement. It's a little prickly. We're going to start prickly this morning, as we've talked about. Wrestling with things you might come into contact with in the Bible could cause somebody to walk away from Jesus. Is that true? Could that happen? How about questions like this? One more. Keep going. How about questions like this? Does the Bible demean women? Does God not like women? I mean, after all, in 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12, I hope you can sense a little bit of my sarcasm. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. This is what the scripture says. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must remain quiet. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, women should remain quiet in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but they must remain in full submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husband at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So we can't ignore these verses. These are in the scriptures, in the New Testament. My question is, does this mean that God endorses men's superiority or maybe even dominance over women? Is God commanding gender dominance or even oppression of women? Or at the very least, at the very least, is God a chauvinistic and discernment and, and does he have a disregard for women? It's an important question to ask. People have made that statement before. How about this? Is the Bible anti-science? Or how could a loving God command such violence in the Old Testament, such as the flood? Or what about, why is it okay for God to kill children? These are questions that are real that people ask. The last set of questions I have is, does the, does the Bible endorse slavery? Exodus 21, verses 20 and 21 says, Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they're not to be punished if the slave recovers for a day or two, since the slave is their property. It appears that human beings can be property of other people, and that God must be perfectly fine with this. Right? Right? Again, a little bit of sarcasm, but a little bit of reality with discussions that people actually have about the scriptures, about whether they're trustworthy, and ultimately about God. Well, after all of that, welcome to Grace Men Live. <laughs> we're in this new series that we're going to be in for a while, into the middle of June, maybe late June, and it's called How Not to Read the Bible. So why are we here? Um, welcome to the guys online. There's a few of you online. Welcome to the guys in the room. The reason that we're here, one of our goals as a church actually, is to increase the biblical literacy rate within church. And I don't mean inside Grace Church, just in general. We want to go after increasing bi the biblically, biblical literacy rate amongst our people. And so I take that seriously. We've taken that seriously for a long time in men's ministry, and I thought this was a great book for us to really tackle this big time for all of us. Now, we also want to equip you to be able to defend your faith, and this is the key, to be able to defend your faith in a God-honoring way. And in this book, we're going to be journeying through um, what I believe is designed to help us learn a couple things, how to read the Bible, how to interpret the Bible, and how to understand the Bible accurately. Those three things combined. And we'll look at the makeup of the Bible because, after all, to understand what Bible verses mean, we need to understand how every Bible verse fits into the grand scheme of the Bible, the big story of the Bible. So, a few expectations for this series, and then I'm going to kick it over to my friends here in just a second. But a few expectations. First, if you have not been here for a while or if this is your first time, you'll see this card on your table. There's two on every table. It says prayer request. Feel free to fill out a prayer request. I didn't just show John's prayer request. This is John's contact information. It's also to be used as a contact card if you are not receiving the emails. Now, we're not sending out the emails like we used to. We used to send them out every week. 
to remind you and had notes on them. And we stopped doing that because the open rate was so low. So we send them out just periodically now, maybe an update or a newsletter or like I did yesterday um, just to remind guys about this. So guys that aren't, aren't on Facebook, they, if we don't send out that email periodically, they don't know anything about what's going on. So Facebook is really the way to get connected with us. If that's not good for you, give us your email and we'll send out information periodically. Uh, for the first couple weeks, I want you guys to know it might feel a little slow. And we're doing that intentionally. Not only does the book start off that way, but we want, we want the tables. Like where you're sitting, you don't have to sit there every week. You have permission to go to a different table next week. Not because you don't like the people, but maybe you want to hear a different perspective or Maybe you know somebody who sat at a different table and they're a good friend of yours and you didn't want to be rude today. You can be rude next week, okay? It's fine. Now, ne this week, we're going to be setting the table uh, for what this book is about, um, how not to read the Bible. The next two weeks, weeks two and three, we're going to be going through four, the four ways to read Scripture, right? And so... These are a little bit slower because we really want to make sure that we're all on the same page on how we're going to be doing the rest of the book and how we're going to be doing the rest of the studies. Um, just a couple rules of engagement as we go. Rules of engagement, right? It's not rules, and you're not to engage with fists. It's just rules of engagement. Like, how do we actually interact at our tables, okay? So first, some of the topics that we're going to cover are going to be prickly. Like the questions that I asked, we are going to cover every one of those topics. Uh, some of your long-held beliefs may challenge you, and that's a good thing. It's super healthy for some of our long-held beliefs to be challenged because they might be religious. They might, they might be passed down family tradition. It might be an understanding that you heard from somebody else about a perspective or a theological topic, and you never really did your own research on it. And so it might make you do this a little bit when you hear us say some things or you might read some things in the book and say, I can't read the rest because that's really too hard. for, And that's OK. We, everyone is welcomed here. OK, it's really important for us to know that you're going to be introduced to ideas that might be foreign to you. If you're already fully sanctified and you are 100 percent like Jesus, you probably are dead, but <laughs> you're excused from being here at Grace Men Live. Otherwise, for the rest of us, we need to engage in discussions and engage in the topics. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us and transform us. Now, Jonathan's sermon this past Sunday, we're no longer following the Sunday sermon. This past Sunday, his, his sermon reminded us how we should strive for unity in the body of Christ. To not let disagreements or prickly conversations cause strife amongst the body of Christ. It's really important. And, and I love this, as long as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So, with that, if you believe that Jesus rode on dinosaurs, but the guy across from you thinks that's hogwash, smile, give him a hug, buy him a cup of coffee on the way out, and come back next week and have a conversation again, okay? My friends, Chris Wokel, Don Bain, I'm sorry, Bain, Don Bain, um, just in case you're wondering, Bain Don Bain also hosts the Aftermath show, which we send out on Thursdays. It's a show. Yeah, it's a showdown. No, I'm just kidding. Um, anything new this week? We, we've got 30 seconds. Okay, real quick. Uh, I was able to go to the, uh, an indoor driving range this last week and uh, hit into a simulator. If you've never done it and you like golf, I highly recommend it. It's just fun when it's 20-some degrees outside to go and, and hit a ball around. I'm the guy that goes and actually hits the ball on the simulated driving range as opposed to going on a golf course because I'm just twisted that way. But what was funny is that on, you can pick all these different golf courses, and one of the golf courses you could pick which was disc golf. Of course. I'm kidding. It's absolutely not because it's not a real thing. Disc golf is not a thing. <laughs> I was really excited. I'm like, I can go practice. Can you imagine standing there whizzing a frisbee into a screen? I can. I cannot. I'm sorry. That's all I got. <laughs> you know, if Paul came today, he would think that hitting a golf ball with a flat stick would be a little weird. I don't know. Compared to throwing a plastic disc. Right. Okay. Let's yes. go with that. We'll stick with that. 
All right, so if you're like me, you might be a skeptic. I'm a naturally born skeptic. That's just the way that I'm wired. Uh, in order for me to be confident in my faith in Jesus and the Bible, I, I have to seek to find answers all the time. And it's not just with scripture, it's with everything being a science-minded person. That's the way I've been for a very, very long time, probably all my life. It's probably why my parents were frustrated with me a lot. But I had three major events happen in my life that caused me to be a skeptic in my faith specifically. The first is when I was 19, my girlfriend died, and I really just questioned God. As I was being drawn to the Lord, as it says in John 6, 44, I was skeptical about God. The second was um, after I said yes to Jesus, I was living in Michigan, which I really doubted whether the Holy Spirit lived in Michigan. Um, I have since to come, come to find out he does. He does live in Michigan as well. But I was away from family. I was living on my own, and this was post-college. And I was really questioning some big decisions in my life, like, should I marry Maureen? That's a big life decision. And I, it was a question mark that I, I was so lonely and so alone living up there. I, I, I was questioning even Jesus at times. The third time that I really was a skeptic or questioning my faith was after a ca catastrophic stroke that my father-in-law had it's been now almost seven years a lot of you guys have heard that story but i really question whether god was a good god when he allows bad things to happen to really good people now you might be like my wife you might not be like me my wife is naturally a person who has the gift of faith maureen has never questioned god ever since she put her trust in yahweh the i am with you god She's never questioned anything, including when her own father had a stroke. She trusts people the same way that she trusts God, for the most part, unless you're a Michigan fan or a Yankees fan. <laughs> but her trusting faith is amazing, and it's truly a gift of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I've depended on Maureen's faith when my faith was skeptical. Now, you may not be either. You may not be a skeptic. You may not be a person who has the gift of faith. And maybe you've never even thought of these, that's fine, but I want to encourage you this morning to really take a look at which one you might be. Because most of us fall on one or the other. Sometimes we go, can hit both at times. The reason that's important is because of what we're going to be going through in this book. Don? Don? Yeah, so About what this book? book I think is going to do for us is it's, um, it's going to help us find answers to some really difficult questions, maybe questions that, you know, we've wrestled with for many years. Uh, it also is going to help us to learn how to read, interpret, and understand the Bible. I know that, uh, you know, when I was, I've only read the Bible through once, cover to cover. Um, I'm in my second time through now. And, you know, I think that um, when I read this book, it really helped me put a lot of things into perspective. And most importantly, gave me a process to go through when I'm, when I'm reading the Bible and how to kind of think through some things. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate about the author is if you look at the acknowledgments page here in this book, he actually acknowledges two atheists. And to our knowledge, I don't think these atheists have ever come to know Jesus. Now, how in the world can a Christian acknowledge atheists in his book that he's writing about the Bible. The thing that I appreciate about him, he, he acknowledges Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. You guys probably know the Richard Dawkins name. Very strong atheists. Not only were they strong, they were incredibly strong critics of the Bible. Why in the world would Dan Kimball thank them and appreciate them and acknowledge them? Why is it good, essentially? Why? Because this, the, he, tr these guys made him ask questions about the Bible that he dug into, and he was able to find answers to their questions, actually. And so when people come at us and ask us really hard questions, I know that I've had friends and family who have done this to me. Early on in my faith, I got angry because I didn't know how to defend the faith, and it actually scared me. As I've gotten more mature in my faith and grown deeper in my knowledge of scripture and some understandings, there's times like I'm comfortable saying, you know what, I don't know, let me get back to you. 
I do some digging and talking to other people. They help me understand it, and then I go back to them, and, and then we have a great discussion. I'm not trying to convince them. I'm just answering their questions. And I believe that's what Dan Kimball has done. He's answered their questions. He's not trying to convince the atheists. But real people have these real questions, and I believe that we really need to answer them to help them understand and have a better understanding of who God is. So one of the things he says is that we should not be closed-minded. Uh, part of one of our rules of engagement is, is about uh, understanding that things are going to be prickly. Uh, we should not be afraid of uh, hearing criticism, and we shouldn't be surprised when people mock the Bible. I mean, we know that occurs. What we should instead do is become more comfortable in those uh, conversations, comfortable with thinking about uh, Scripture, examining Scripture and how to do so. Uh, and we're, we're going we're gonna to go gonna, through some examples. We're doing that. Yeah, we're going to see some of that. Uh, he's, he reminds us that uh, 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to be prepared to give a defense for our faith. And, and that word that he uses is really translated apologetics. You know, to be prepared to apologize or to be apologetic uh, can, can I ask in another scripture. question? Yes, sir. Before Don goes on. When, when you were in the army and you were defending our country... Were you always actively engaging with warfare? Uh, no. And so there were times that you engaged whoever was around you that was not a U.S. citizen. Sometimes you engaged them just with, hello, how are you? Yes. Okay. So yes. defending our faith is not always punching someone in the face. Correct. Or it is not. Right. I mean, facetiously it, punching somebody in the face. No, you're absolutely correct. Um Def defending our faith can be walking beside, can be demonstrating, can be uh, leading by example, can be showing, communicating. And that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, and as I've said before, we each have a responsibility in our walk with Christ. Uh, we won't be transformed by the Holy Spirit by sitting on our duffs. We need to do some things. And understanding our scripture better uh, is one of those ways. So the author asks a really great question. Can someone really become an atheist by reading the Bible? I mean, it's, pretty, it's a pretty deep question to really ponder. Like, how can that really be possible? But he gives a great example. So uh, he comes up with an example of this guy. He's a young man, uh, described as a millennial. He's a leader in the church, uh, and he became a leader on his campus ministry when he went to college. He wasn't mad at the church uh, or even done, um, you know, being a millennial in a church, which oftentimes isn't very welcoming. Um, I always feel bad for the millennials. They get such a bad rap, especially I, in church. I don't feel bad at all. They, they deserve it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. As a father of four millennials, I don't feel bad at all. I'm almost a millennial. <laughs> okay. I'm two years away from being a millennial. I'm a baby boomer, so you're still a pup to me. Um, so this guy, when he left to go to college, he began reading the Bible really for the first time in his life, which is interesting to say. He joined a Bible study. Uh, and he read things like we're talking about that he's never read before. Um, specifically Exodus uh, 4, 21 to 23 really rattled him. It was God sending a message through Moses. They would kill the firstborn males in all of Egypt uh, as the last plague. Uh, in Exodus 12, 29 through 30, um, God followed through on the threat. And at midnight he struck dead all the firstborn of Egypt. And there was weeping in every home since there was not a home without someone who died. This guy really started to wrestle with that. Like... Uh, is this the God who's, who's been, been following all these years? Uh, it, and it really rattled him in this instance way down to his soul level. Uh, but he had nobody to walk beside him. He was alone in college, even though he was at, these, uh, at this Bible study. So how is it that Christians can be horrified and angered when they read about King Herod, you know, wanting to kill the firstborn, Jesus, you know, Jesus and all the, the young boys uh, living in Jerusalem? You know, do they see King Herod as wicked and heartless? Um, yet these same people don't grimace at the Exodus story. I mean, there seem to be parallel. Uh, how is it okay for God to do the same thing as King Herod was planning doing? And why is it evil when King Herod does it, but acceptable when God does? Like, yeah, it's okay that King Herod did that. Or it's okay that God did that. Yeah. But King Herod doing that, like, oh, that's terrible. Like, wait a minute. Like, should, to, Shouldn't the to, same to, thing be applied to, to both? Shouldn't we look at it through the same filter at least? 
Well, so can reading the Bible cause someone to become an atheist? Maybe. Uh, but as we discussed during the Romans series, at the very least, it causes somebody to deconstruct their, their, their faith. Uh-oh. Uh, 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 <laughs> about God and, and his word. Is this a bad thing? Well, that depends also. Uh, this guy in particular searches online for others who are raising questions about verses, uh, about verses he was coming across, and he was he was finding things that were causing him to deconvert. Uh, when his, I have a question about that. When, like, is that a mistake to go online to do something like that and do the research? Well, I mean, that's the culture that we're in. See, and we're we're going to talk about culture and how that applies to us and our understanding of scripture. Uh, Back when I became a Christian, the only person, the only way I could get answers about verses was talk to my pastor and the guy discipling me, my family, and close friends. But today we have the challenge of the internet, and we're going to talk about some of the other issues that, that these these guys are running into. But this young uh, person in particular that we're talking about uh, had his confidence in Scripture uh, obliterated. He could no longer trust Jesus as his Savior because of those things that he was finding online and these memes about these weird verses. Uh, reading uh, the Bible caused this guy to deconstruct his faith to the point of no longer trusting the Bible. And it's not just Christians who deconstruct, non-Christians do so as well. Non-Christians stumble over these things. Either way, this guy didn't have a person uh, who he was in relationship with to talk through these things. And... and We've talked about deconstructing your faith. If you want to talk about that at, at greater length, feel free to come up to us and talk about that. Or if you want to get a better understanding of what that means, um, deconstructing your faith is not always bad. A lot of people do it, and they get a deeper understanding of, of their faith. That's healthy. And, and it, in, some, in most cases, it ends up strengthening their faith. Right. Yeah. But the way this guy did it was he, de he went and deconstructed his faith without talking to anybody in the faith. He went and found people who left the faith, and they, they left the faith over things like this, right? So what we want to do is we want to help people learn how to have a deeper dive in the scriptures, which we're going to do right now. So what's the difference? Here's the answer to the difference between how King Herod tried to do it and what happened in Exodus chapter 4. God brings divine consequences to Pharaoh. That's what ends up happening. There's a, you have to remember, everything that we look at through scripture, we have to look at through the big story of the Bible. God is in charge. And if we understand these two scriptures, these two uh, sections of scripture, these two stories, through that lens that God's in charge, he's the creator, then that helps us understand what happened. So what happens? God actually reminded Pharaoh how many times about what he was doing to the Israelites? How many times before he struck the firstborn dead? How many times did he remind him? Nine times. So is that is that a God who doesn't care and a God who doesn't give people chances? Not, he's like a cat, nine lives. He was given nine chances. Now, what about the, the section that talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart? It's a fascinating topic. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, it says that two times in scripture. Nine times in scripture, it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. There's a bit of a mysteriousness with this, isn't there? Did God do the hardening or did by God asking, it caused Pharaoh to harden his own heart against God? We have to say, for me, it's like, I don't know. There's a mysteriousness there that I'm okay with, right? Because if we take a deeper dive, we have a better understanding that there's actually a mysteriousness between God's sovereignty and man's free will. There's wrestling matches that happen today. There's actually denominations because of it, right? So we have to say, are we okay 
with the mysteriousness parts of God. I sure hope so because he's God, right? That's what makes him God. And for a long time, I did not like that mysteriousness, so I remained God in my own life. And if people are, are there, we want to love them anyway because God calls us to. to. And that's where we have to learn how do we engage in these conversations without causing people to question God even more by our reactions or how we respond, right? So remember, Pharaoh is treating God's chosen people in a horrible way, horrible treatment, very harsh conditions. He even refused to let them be fed at times. And because he, he knew that if he freed the Israelites, what would happen to his economy? What would happen to his kingdom? What would happen to his reign? Uh, maybe it would be really bad. He would lose everything. The only way that Pharaoh could let God's people go would be if a mighty hand would finally compel him to release the slaves. And that's what God finally did. For me, if I'm watching this in a movie, I'd be like, on, time, on, on life number five, I would have been like, seriously? And then six, you're like, I mean, if I treated my kids like that, people would be questioning whether I was a good dad maybe, right? Like, you give your kids nine chances before you finally give them a punishment? Man, God gave him nine chances. So again, there's that balance between God's sovereignty and mankind's free will. And that's the mysteriousness of all of it. Now, what about King Herod? He was wanting to kill the Messiah and thwart whose plans? The creator of all things. He was trying to thwart God's plans. To rescue the world, which God was not going to let happen. He was not going to let one person thwart his plans, right? So, one was God's consequences, and the other was man's plan to bring God's plan down. Well, who's going to win that battle? I don't know if you've ever tried to bring God's plans down, but it usually doesn't go very well, at least not for me, when I try to do it my own way. So we all know that there's consequences in life, and Pharaoh had the chance to prevent this from happening, actually. He could have released God's people without the 10th plague happening. He could have. We must keep in mind the big story of the Bible and look at everything through that lens that everything points to Jesus. He is redemption. He is savior. And he came to buy back or exchange one life for another person's life. Now, though there are strange and weird things in the Bible, we have to remember there are explanations to it. The question is, do we take the time? Do we take the time to research it? And do we take the time to maybe be okay that this is really hard to understand or this part might be mysterious? A lot of times we don't like to give that answer to somebody because they might walk away and say, you are crazy. And that's okay. We need to be okay with that. So, how do we know the Bible is the one sacred book out there amongst so many other holy books? Who's to say that the Bible and its teaching make sense for us today? How do we do that? How do we practically apply the Bible to our lives today? We can't just sweep things under the rug like the, things, the topics that we've talked about so far this morning. We can't just sweep them under the rug and act like they're not there. I know I did that with some of these big topics for many, many years because I didn't know how to defend it, even to other Christians. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where to turn for many, many years. But if we don't have reasonable responses, people are likely to walk potentially away from the Lord or at the very least away from seeking the Lord. And that, even that alone is a wrestling match. Well, did God know they were going to walk away? These are the wrestling matches that we have. One thing that we want to make sure we don't do 
is use my laziness or my lack of desire to go find the answers. We don't want to use that as an excuse of, well, God knew they'd walk away anyway. Well, maybe he was going to use you to speak truth into their life. So let's, let's do the hard work. Let's do the dig deeping. Now, the what? What did I say? The uh, dig deeping? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah the deep, deep digging. digging. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I need my friends <laughs> up here with me. So this is the key, though. Let's examine these Bible verses uh, in their context while applying specific study methods. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next two weeks. The next two weeks might be a little dry. Hang in there because it is... After the week three, it's going to be awesome. We are going to have some prickly conversations around these tables. And I just hope that no one kicks their chair out, slams something, and walks out the door. That's, that's my prayer. But none of these things should keep us from taking a deep dive. Uh, nearly all of the disturbing, wild, and crazy things in the Bible, they're, they're in the Bible, right? Right. Uh, they're being, usually they're being read incorrectly, uh, like unicorns. We're going to talk about that in a second. And usually they are strange and they are difficult to read. And that's why people st- typically stay away from them. Well, so it, exactly. Uh, and the, in fact, it, it, don't ever read a Bible verse or you might end up believing in magical uniform, unicorns. Wait, before, don't read a Bible verse? Don't read a Bible verse. Be, before we started talking about this new session... Right, and I, I want to see hands. Before we started talking about this, how many had never heard that Bibles, that unicorns were in the Bible? Yeah, see? See? You too also. That's fascinating. So it, th- this, is, this is our challenge. This is what we're trying to address. Uh, in fact, there are unicorns in the Bible mentioned nine times. Uh, there are memes on the internet that talk about unicorns and their magic and their magical powers and uh, you know related to rainbows somehow. Do unicorns poop rainbows? Or do that's they a, ride on rainbows. That is a why, very great why question. In a men's group, do we always end up talking about poop? It always happens. It we're, always happens. We're not doing that, guys. Um, people use things. Uh, like these memes and these stories and these hard verses in scripture to discredit the Bible or they attempt to and it is challenging but it's even worse than that there are those now that no longer call the Bible the good book but the evil book so we're going to we're going to spend some time learning how to respond to these uh, and and to defend our Bible so here's an example Uh, in in did you know that the Bible says that Christians should not play football? In Leviticus 11, verse 7 through 8, it says, And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. So logic would dictate that football players can't grab the pig, the pig skin. A football, right? Um, this was uh, actually made, this line was actually made very popular in a uh, Golden Globe award-winning national TV show. Uh, and uh, if you were listening to it, anybody would thought that Christians are really whacked for having this outdated view. So when I read this in the book, and then I was studying this, I said to Pastor Scott this morning, I, I had this itch in the back of my head on what TV show this was. I couldn't figure it out. So uh, Karen and I had watched the TV series West Wing, uh, a couple years ago, and it was just something about that. And if you've never seen the show, it's actually pretty interesting. But it's maybe 15 years old now. Um, there's a scene in it where the president is talking to a group, and there's a gal uh, that has a TV show, and she's uh, she's talking junk about him basically, uh, and and talking stuff that that he uh, takes umbrage with. And so he calls her out and actually uses this verse and a few others like it to call her to the carpet. And in this section here, he's talking about it, um, you know, that how crazy that verse sounds to all of us if you don't know the Bible and you don't know, you know, the, the process we're going to go through here. But what's interesting is that if you watch the whole show, he actually supports what we're talking about because he calls her to the carpet for doing things that 
uh, you know, just reading a verse and taking it kind of out of context. But why is that verse not true? Why is it not true? Well, a football isn't a pigskin, is it? It's cowhide. And we're going to get to it next lesson. That's sorry. not this lesson. Yeah, nice job, Scott. I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. I'm Spoiler. so excited. So when reading the Bible, never read a Bible verse. You must read all the verses. Well, you need to read verses after and before. Uh, you got to be willing to explore beyond uh, a literal and out-of-context reading of a single verse. Uh, when we do, we discover the Bible's not sheer nonsense. So we're going to wrap up with the unicorn. We're going to explain the unicorn. Why, why is the unicorn? So I'm first going to help us understand this. We take the unicorn back to the King James Version. It was the, the, the first, it was actually the second English Bible ever printed. It was not the first English Bible ever printed. And we go to this and they, we see it in the King James Version the 1611 version specifically, and you can still find it in that version today. So I'm going to read, now I'm reading out of the NIV, okay? So it's a little bit more understandable, but where our version does not say unicorn, I'm going to put the word unicorn so that we understand that this was the King James version, although I'm reading it out of the NIV. Does that make sense? Um, so Isaiah 34, 7 says this, and the unicorn will fall with them. The bulls, the bull calves, and the great bulls. Their land will be drenched with blood, and the dust will be soaked with their fat. Now, I, uh, Job, this is probably my favorite one. Job 39, verses 9 through 12, it says this. Will the unicorn consent to serve you? Will he stay by your manger at night? Can you hold firm to the furrow with a harness? Will the unicorn till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on him for his great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to him? Can you trust him to bring in your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? Does that sound like the same unicorns that our world has depicted today? So, it makes you question, wait a minute, what are they talking about? Well, we have to go back to the original Hebrew and Greek. So the Hebrew word for unicorn, as it's stated here, according to the King James Version, is rehem, R-E-E-M, rehem. And the audience who received rehem in 1400 to 700 BC would have known what animal they were talking about with rehem, and it didn't have any rainbows in it. This was referring to an animal of great strength, as it says here, right? An animal that would bring all the grain in. It, that, that's, a, that's a strong animal. And then it was an animal with a single horn. Now, the 1611 scholars didn't know what animal Rehem was depicting or referring to. When the Hebrew Bible was translated to Greek in the second or third century, they chose the Greek word monokeros to describe rehem. And monokeros, translated to English, is literally one-horned. Well, the best English word to represent one-horned in 1611 was unicorn. So unicorn was not a depiction of the myth mythical, magical, one-horned, rainbow-pooping, just for you, Don, animal, <laughs> mythical, and it rides on clouds. That's not the animal that they were depicting. Even in 1611, if you were to think of a strong animal with one horn, what animal would you think of? A rhinoceros. A rhinoceros. Thank you. Because the scientific name for the Indian one-horned rhino is rhinoceros unicornis. Isn't that fascinating? So they took it down to unicorn in 1611. But in, in 1400 to 700 BC, the, the, the people receiving it, they, th there were various types of rehems. So it was a very large, powerful oxen that would work the fields. And it would have been like a bull with a single horn, a rhino. 
the Assyrians called this animal Remu. And today's scholars, they translate Rahem into the English world word wild oxen. So in the NIV and any other anything else besides the King James 1611 would translate that word now to wild oxen. And what's really fascinating is because of cultural change, the word unicorn, the name unicorn, the animal unicorn in 1611 was even different than what we would know a unicorn today. So because of that, culture influences how you read things, including scripture. So were unicorns in the Bible? The short answer, yes. They were one, there were one-horned animals, strong oxen that people would have known. But were they the white, mythical, rainbow, riding, and pooping, single-horned, mythical, riding on clouds? Animal? No, it's not. So why is this important for us today? Uh, again, there are memes all over the internet and people are having conversations uh, trying to show that the Bible is filled with nonsense. Uh, if you didn't know the historical context, as Pastor Scott has just explained, you, you could easily get sucked into believing that there are rainbow pooping unicorns in the Bible. Uh, and if you believe that, then you could believe that the Bible is crazy and not credible and is just sheer nonsense. Once you research the original message or the original usage of the word in context uh, and where the, the English word first appeared in the King James Version, then it's very clear that the Bible does not teach that these mythical white horses with horns uh, are in the Bible. You want to send it to tables for discussion? Yeah, so I have table discussion questions on uh, the, the, the screen for you guys. Um, they're not on your table notes today. Um, I tried to give you guys more information on your table notes. Uh, so the questions are up on the board. We'll take about 15 to 20 minutes to chat through these things. It's 713. We'll go till about 733 or so. Uh, so those of you who need to leave at 730, feel free to get up and leave. And then uh, we'll wrap up at 733.